Uh, may I invite Pastor Piri to come and take us through the project overview, and I'm hoping we'll all be able to follow through uh, his submissions, then we can be able to see how to interact with the presentations. Pastor Piri. Good morning. I'm not going to take time. I'm going to explain the journey that we're going to take through this morning. I know we've given you some documents, and it can be overwhelming sometimes to have all these pieces of paper. This whole project, the vision is to be salt and light, for the church to be salt and light in the community. And so we're going to start by actually going through a small series. We're going to do a simulation this morning. Uh, you're going to hear our trustees come and share. And with the sharing that they're going to do, we're going to start with follow me, getting the church to understand God's heart for the lost and God's heart for communities. And, and as we go through the training, our desire is that you will go back and train your churches. Um, I was having a discussion with the Secretary General and we were saying that you might do it from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. You might decide, let's start this pilot with the young people. You might decide, let's start this pilot with the women's ministry. Ultimately, if you can do to the whole church, that's ideal. But I know that as pastors, you've got your programs that you're running. Somehow you need to integrate this model into what you're doing already so that you don't feel like you're starting another program. We're going to be coming alongside, on behalf of the trustees, I will be available to come alongside to work out some of the modalities. Follow Me series is the launch, is the introduction. Then after that, we're going to introduce a concept called the round tables. We're going to spend more time later on explaining those. And the round tables is basically the evangelistic strategy that you will do with your people reaching out to the lost. The Follow Me series is for the church. The round tables is for the lost. So the challenge is that after you've challenged your people on the Follow Me series, uh, Matthew 4, you will then challenge each of the church members to go and find non-Christians. So in the small groups we're calling roundtables, which we'll explain, they are not for Christians. It's for non-Christians in the marketplace. The discussion might also include that maybe not just the marketplace, it might include uh, in the different contexts where we are in our communities. And so we're going to have to look at how do we actually implement it in the various communities. So it's for non-Christians, and they'll be able to take them through two sections. The first one is successful living. John Maxwell basically says that uh, the church, we want to tell the world that the world needs Jesus, but the world is actually asking the question, we want to be successful. So the idea is that when we go to the world, we don't start with, you need Jesus. We start with, do you want to be successful? And the idea is that John Maxwell uh, is known as a successful Christian leader. And so we've got that brand. We also have, have our champions, the trustees, who I think in our nation have been modeling that. Here, as fathers in the nation, you've also been modeling that. And so we're able to say, do you want to be successful? And then you, we, the last part is you need to understand intentional living. And in there, there will be an opportunity to introduce the gospel. So that's in brief the project that we're going to be running. We're going to be working alongside with you in order to see it established. Without wasting time, we're now going to go into the simulation and we're going to go into uh, a brief model of what this journey is going to be like. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to invite uh, Pastor Tom Dishel to come and actually lead us as we start with follow me and value people. Praise God, guys. Hey, listen, it is so wonderful to be with everybody. And, uh, you know, we've been working on this. This is not an exact science. That's why you're here. Uh, you're not the guinea pigs, but the fact of the matter is, implementation is the hardest thing that we have to do as leaders. We all have all the information we need. Anybody has information. But to bring a systematic program that can impact the churches in a nation and then in a continent. Uh, I believe that from Zimbabwe, I believe that some of you will be leaders that will impact other nations, other uh, organizations, and that we will see this become a powerful, powerful tool to bring us into some alignment. Uh, you know, this is not anybody being a big deal. This isn't anybody trying to be the leader of something. We're here to serve one another and serve through a vehicle called equip that is outside of any one of us so none of us gets offended or can you know feel challenged we say okay we recognize this as a worldwide voice probably the most significant voice 
in motivational speaking in the world today, let alone in the, in, in, in the most significant voice, one of the most significant voices in the church. So when I look at this, I say, what a privilege for me to just even be a part of it. And I know there's others that have gone before. Uh, John himself has been distressed over the way that his own organization, uh, Enjoy, has unfolded in parts of the world. Equip bombed in Africa. And uh, when they asked me why I felt it bombed, I went to the first one in Cape Town, and uh, they brought in people that had no relevance to us in Africa, <laughs> had never seen Africa, had no idea what we were facing, and they're gonna teach us information that, quite frankly, was not relevant to what we're talking about. So when we do this, we wanna make it relevant to our situations. You're great teachers. I'm not about to stand up here and try to teach you. I don't have anything to say to you that you don't already have in the sense of more information. What we're doing is we're facilitating what John himself has taught and saying, okay, this is what we need to do to get foundations in our churches. I want to equip my men, my pastors, our churches to get us on some great foundations that eventually can impact the nation. And that's what this is about. So this first session that I've been asked to do is uh, called Follow Me and Value People. It is not my teaching, it is John's teaching, and I'm just going to highlight it. You have a questionnaire that's been given to you, uh, or at least a, a, a blank, and this is how your people would be taught. You would be teaching it, or at some time, there may be a chance that if you don't feel your people can teach it, there would be a video presentation by John himself or by somebody you trust that could, and your person could become a facilitator in a position. But right now, we would expect you to teach it and, we, and train people to teach this. So John gives a story about how he graduated and was getting ready to be, uh, to be his first, have his first church as a pastor. And uh, he sits down with his father and asks him, Dad, do you have any words of advice about being a pastor? Uh, I'll tell you what, I think we've all had that question asked to us before. And he says, I never forgot his words. He says, John, if you value people and you unconditionally love them, your church will always be full. He went on to explain that few people receive unconditional love or are highly valued by others. And he said, if you just do those two things, you'll fill your church. He goes on to say, I want to talk to you about a person much wiser than my father who said it long before my father, Jesus. Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll teach you how to value people. Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22 we know the story. Jesus is walking along the beach in Galilee. Jesus sees two brothers, Simon and Peter. Uh, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They're fishing. They're throwing their nets, their nets into the lake. Of course, we know that he says, throw your nets on the other side. And uh, when he gets done, he says, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. Uh, they didn't ask questions. They simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came to another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee. They're mending their nets. Jesus makes the same offer to them. And they were just as quick to follow, abandoning their boat and their father. These are three follow me thoughts that we want to consider today. Uh, and we want to integrate them into our minds and our hearts. First of all, Jesus is looking for people to follow him. I think that's, out, I think that's pretty straightforward. He is looking for people to follow him. And uh, he wants you and I as his disciples. Uh, he wants us to be disciples. He wants us to follow him. In fact, uh, just look at your neighbor and say, hey, he wants you to be a disciple today. That's what he wants. Turn to the other guy and say, he wants you to follow him. <laughs> Secondly, he wants, he, he finds people where they're at. I think this is important that we understand that he finds people in their environment. He comes, he came to where the guys were. These were fishermen. By the way, I was just, seven days ago, I was on the Sea of Galilee. It was amazing. 
You know, we just took our annual tour, and it was just fantastic. And I can imagine. But Jesus came to where these men, in their boats, he comes to where you and I are. That's where Jesus works with us. He doesn't uh, call us to come up somewhere. He says, hey, I'll meet you where you are. And that's the very fact of the incarnation. Jesus came from heaven to live on earth. He was incarnate and lived amongst us. And uh, so Jesus basically says, no, I'm going to find you. I'll find where you are. We need to do the same. And third, his words, follow me, are the greatest leadership words that have ever been uttered. Why? Well, because the person who said it was Jesus, first of all. Follow me means Jesus will be your example. Uh, he's saying, if you follow me, I'll show you how to live. I'll teach you the values you need to have. Just watch me. Observe me. Just to see how I do things. Secondly, Jesus will be with you. He'll be with you. This means that he wants to be our friend, our companion. He wants to hang out with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. Actually, he wants to communicate and connect with us. Third, Jesus will help you to discover your significance. Your significance. These guys were all fishermen by trade. Here Jesus all of a sudden asks them, he says, hey, if you follow me, I'm going to upgrade you in life. Instead of you catching person bass, I'm going to have you catch men. No more tilapia. Men. And there's, here's the amazing thing. Their response was immediate. They had an immediate response. And this is what always amazes me. They hear these words and they just respond. I don't understand that. I mean, I don't respond that well. Why would they just respond? I always ask myself this question. Why was it they were so quick to respond? Was it what he said? I mean, what he said was pretty amazing. Was it his reputation and who he was? Did they already know that he was Jesus? Or could it have been, and I think this is true, that there was something about Jesus when he interacted with these fishermen that they could tell that he valued them? Maybe through the way he looked at them or the tone of his voice. But they could tell that he valued them as individuals. Three questions that all followers ask their leaders. Number one, do you care for me? Before somebody's going to follow you, they want to know if you care for them and if you have their best interest at heart. Number two, can you help me? In other words, if I follow you, are things going to get better? Is my life going to change? Are things going to become a little bit better or a little bit brighter in my life? That's why people stand in lines to see people. That's why people wait in waiting rooms. That's why people follow. Because they think that something better is going to happen. Third, people ask, can I trust you? Can I trust you? I'll follow you. If I follow you, will you be true to your word? Will you be faithful to me? Now, for those three questions, do you care for me, can you help me, and can I trust you? Jesus says yes to all three of them. Yes, I care for you. Yes, you can trust me. And yes, I can help you. And then those words, follow me, become quite contagious. They become quite inviting to the ear when you know that the person who's saying it to you is trustworthy, that he cares for you, and he can absolutely help you. That's exactly who Jesus was. Now, I've heard it said many times, and it's wonderful when people believe in a leader, but it's even more wonderful when the leader believes in the people. Jesus was a believer in people. He saw these fishermen, simple Galileans, who others would have overlooked in society. No one would ever look into those boats and see potential leaders in those men that were mending their nets. And that they would become the transformational leaders that would be known for centuries to follow. No one would ever look at them and see that who they were except for Jesus. Why? Why? 
because he valued them. He put a value on them. He not only sees what's in them, but he sees what's in you and I. He values us. He values you. He values me. We can follow the footsteps of Jesus through the gospel. All the gospels talk about this principle. And when you see it, you realize that Jesus does value people. One example is the story of Zacchaeus. And I'm not going to go through it today for time. You all know the story of Zacchaeus. But Jesus valued Zacchaeus more than Zacchaeus valued himself. Zacchaeus was a small man. He had a, uh, a terrible reputation. Jesus valued Zacchaeus more than others valued Zacchaeus. Nobody valued Zacchaeus. Nobody wanted to be around the tax collector. So what did the rest of the crowd do? When they saw that Jesus wanted to eat at Zacchaeus' house, when he took an interest in Zacchaeus, they became indignant. They couldn't believe that Jesus would go home with a crook. I think it's a beautiful story demonstrating the fact that Jesus puts a tin on our heads. Regardless of who we are. When he sees us, he puts the highest number possible. He says, you're a 10. You're the best. Why would he do that? Well, it's very simple. He created us in his image. He gave us gifts. He gave us purpose. He gave us a why for living. Then Jesus sees us, and he sees us with a 10 on our forehead. You're my man. You're the guy. See, when the people in town saw Zacchaeus, I don't think they gave him a 10. Oh, maybe they did. Maybe it was a minus 10. Isn't that how we view some people? I know this, it wasn't anything on the plus side, and that was for sure. Tax collectors were despised, they were hated, and yet Jesus saw something. Let's go to another story, the Samaritan woman. You know the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus is meeting a woman at the well at noontime. He asks her questions and then his disciples go into town to get some food. When they come back, they're suspicious of him. Why is he talking to a woman like this? Oh, it, you know, they didn't say it, but you can see it on their faces. I've seen those faces before. I don't know about you. As a pastor, I see those faces. Why are you hanging out with him? Why are you doing those things? I've seen those faces on Christians who were shocked when somebody would reach out and value someone that the rest of them wouldn't value. Jesus valued a Samaritan woman more than she valued herself. Jesus valued the Samaritan woman more than the disciples valued her. Are you starting to get the picture? That's the picture of putting a value on someone. To God, every human being has value. I want you to hear this. Jesus values you more than you value yourself and Jesus values you more than anyone else values you that's Jesus that's the Jesus that I've fallen in love with in fact he wanted you to make sure that you didn't miss the point we not only have pictures throughout the gospels of him interacting with people showing how much he valued them. But Jesus wanted to make sure that we didn't miss it. So let me tell you a little parable. It's a parable that we all know. Jesus taught this. He said, the parable of the prodigal son. I'll pick up in the middle of the story. The story is already, the son's already asked for his inheritance. He's already gone and squandered his money, blowing it with parties. And he's now in a pig pen. And he has nothing. He's in desperate shape. And he's now starting to come to his senses. That's when the story picks up. The prodigal son, in verses 17 and 20 through 24, it says, that brought him to his senses. This is the message Bible. It says, that brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day. And here I am, starved to death. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against God and I've sinned before you. Don't, I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and he went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. 
His heart pounding, he ran out and embraced him and kissed him. The son, the son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, quick, bring the clean set of clothes and dress him. Put on the family ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Get the grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a party. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now is alive. Given up for lost and is now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. You know, I want you to notice the phrase in that passage. It says, I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. You see, when he went home to his father, the son started his speech. Now, I'm sure he had rehearsed this speech for a long, long time. And the interesting phrase is, the son started his speech, this thing that he'd practiced for so long, this is the son who had taken his inheritance from his father, who had shamed his father. And he had practiced this speech because he really wanted to get it right. And I love that he said, okay, what I've been practicing every day, I'm going to say it now to my dad. I'm going to make sure my dad hears this. What was the speech he'd been practicing? Father, I sinned against God. I sinned against you. I don't deserve to even be called your son. And I love this phrase. But the father wasn't listening. What's dad doing? Well, here's what he was doing. He's calling the servants. He's saying, get a robe. Get some shoes. Get a ring. Let's take care of this guy. He's back. He was dead. He's alive. Let's have a party. The first response of the father was to celebrate, not condemn. I don't want you to miss this point. The first response of the dad was to celebrate. My boy came home. He didn't look at his boy and say, son, what have you been doing? Do you understand that you've blown all your money? I mean, that's what I would have said. <laughs> Wouldn't you have done that? He could have said a whole list of stuff. I mean, he could have con considered a teaching time for the boy. Now sit down, I'm going to teach you something. But instead, it was a time for the baby boy, for his son, to be celebrated, not condemned. If you read the rest of the story, it says all his older brother, the older son, was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Calling over one of the house boys, he asked, what's going on? He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast barbecue style because he found him safe and sound. The brother stalked off in a huff and an angry sulk, refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief, but you've never thrown a party for me and my friends. Then this son of yours, who's thrown away all of your money on whores, shows up and you go all out and have a feast for him his father said son you don't understand you're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours but this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate your brother was dead and he's alive he was lost and now he's found I want you to notice that the older brother is the one who stalks off and sulks and refuses to join in and the father comes out to try to find him and to try to talk to him. And oh, here's a phrase. We've heard this before. But he wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen. See, that son wouldn't listen either. The first son didn't listen. The second son didn't listen. The son said, look how many years I stayed here serving you. Never giving you one moment of grief. And you've never thrown a party for me and my friends. Then this son of yours who's throwing away your money on horse shows up and you go all out. Son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time. Everything that is mine is yours. This is a wonderful time to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead. He's alive and now he's found. You see, 
the father valued the son more than the son valued himself. Twice he said, I don't deserve to be called your son. In fact, the son was so disappointed in himself that he lowered his expectations of how the father would respond. He even practiced his speech. I don't deserve to be your son. I'll be a servant. Just tell me what you want to do. I'll even bunk in the barn if you want me to. I'll do the chores of a servant. Our disappointment in ourselves often gets projected on God. You see, disappointment is a gap between an expectation and a reality. But you can't surprise God. He's God. He knows everything. When you mess up, he doesn't look and say, oh my goodness, I hadn't expected that. He knew. He knows. Oh, I had no idea that you would sin. Oh, I'm shocked. What am I going to do? You can't disappoint God. What happened was this. Because the prodigal was disappointed in himself, he lowered his expectations of how his father would receive him. He thought the father would maybe accept him as a servant. But he never considered the idea that the father would accept him as a son. The father valued the son more than the brother valued the son as well. In fact, they both didn't listen. The father wouldn't listen because he had unconditional love. And his unconditional love caused him to value people. When the son began to say his speech, the father said, I'm not listening to that. I love you unconditionally. I love you just as you are. The older brother, when he heard about the music and the party, stalked off and was greatly disappointed. He, but he wouldn't listen either. He wouldn't listen to his dad trying to say, look, your brother's back. He returned. He was lost. He's been found. He wouldn't listen. You see, unconditional love values people. Legalism overvalues works and undervalues people. The son was a legalist. Is that my time up? I, I can stop anywhere along here. Got two more pages. The son was a legalist. Basically, his response was to condemn, not celebrate. Can you see the great difference between the father and the son? The prodigal son comes home and the dad says, oh my goodness, let's celebrate. He didn't condemn. The brother says, oh my goodness, I want to condemn. I mean, I've been working hard and he hasn't been working at all. Did you notice how the brother overvalued himself? Overvalued all the things that he was doing for his dad? He was counting. He's keeping track. He was counting all of his works, all the things that he was doing. No, no unconditional love there. No value for someone else. In verse 2, he said this. He says, look how many years I've stayed around serving you, never giving you a moment of grief. Can I tell you something? The older brother was giving the father all kinds of grief. What an arrogant statement. You know what grieves the father? You know what gives fathers grief? When we don't love and people, l love and value people like the father loves and values people. That grieves his heart. You see, God values people. If, and if I value God as a follower of Christ, then I also need to value people. I was out with Mark Cole, Dr. John says. He says at Pebble Beach at a golf tournament for equip. He told me, my family is here. Would you mind going out to dinner? I said, I'd be glad to. We had a great time, a wonderful time. On the way back, Mark said, thanks, John. You just really valued my family. And I said, I'm glad to. Of course I value your family. I value you, and you value your family. See, values add value. Can I tell you something? When you value a person, you value who they value. To say that you and I are Christ followers and yet not unconditionally love and value other people is to say that we 
are Christ followers in words, but not in deed. I brought with me something I've enjoyed reading for a long time. It just summarizes the message of how Jesus valued people. Here's what it says. It's called the pit. A man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person came along and said, it's logical that someone would fall down there. A Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in a pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into a pit. A news reporter wanted an exclusive story on his pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve your pit. A Calvinist said, if you'd been saved, you'd never fallen into that pit. A Wesleyan said, you were saved and you still fell into that pit? A charismatic said, just confess that you're not in that pit. A realist said, that's a pit. An IRS agent said, ask him if, we're paying, if, if he were paying the taxes on the pit. A county inspector asked if he had a special permit to dig a pit. An evasive person came along and avoided the pit altogether. The whole subject of it. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything until you've seen my pit. A bookie said, chances are that anyone could fall into the pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would help each of one of us today to see people the way you see them and to value people the way you value them. Help us not to be the elder brother, always thinking of the good things we're doing for you and how much more we must be your favorite son because of all of our wonderful deeds. Help us to understand that you love all of us unconditionally. Help us to have the heart of the Father, a heart that celebrates, jumps for joy and rejoices when a lost person is found. One that doesn't just have a list of all the rules and legalism and condemnations that we so quickly thrust on others. Help us to see people like you see them. Help us to love people like you love them. Help us to value people like you value them. I pray this in your mighty name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Praise God.